those of you who uh, haven't been aware of it up to yet, we have a new president um, <laughs> that happened a few months ago, right? And he brought on board a new science advisor, John, uh, John Holder. But the point of this slide is to emphasize that both of these individuals have uh, specified as a matter of policy they're really interested in issues related to energy and environment. So energy and environment have come front stage right now as far as this current administration is concerned. In the next image then, we'll see that the National Research Council of the National Academies has also weighed in as far as climate change is concerned in this very recent report as far as 2009. And the points that they make in that report are uh, five. They talk about this integration between science and society. They talk about the importance of climate, human and environmental systems. The notion of observing systems. They specify the importance of coupled models and this notion of adaptation science. So this administration as well is very much interested in the whole area of adaptation. In Washington, we're hearing it increasingly in conversations, whether it's with the Office of Management and Budget or the, or the Office of Science and Technology <laughs> Policy. Both of them talk in terms of adaptation. We know that there are all kinds of changes already entrained in the atmosphere, entrained in these systems. And so adaptation is an important issue for the administration going ahead from here. In the next image then, we'll see that the National Science Foundation is on record in terms of talking about climate change through this particular report. It's the notion of improving the understanding of the planet. It's much what goes on in the biosciences. It goes on in the geosciences. The notion then of cross-cutting interdisciplinary programs, and we're going to come back to that in a moment, that's going to be essential to creating the decision support systems that are needed as we go ahead from here. Next one. This then speaks to what uh, Dave and Tony have been talking about, this notion of an integration between environmental observations in the lower right-hand corner, larger scale experiments such as, uh, such as Strion and others that could be imagined by the community, and the importance of modeling. We're going to come back to modeling in a little while, but this notion of multi-scale modeling connecting what's going on at the local to regional scale with what's happening at the global scale and then coming back down from global to regional. The holy grail in many respects being the capacity to make a prediction about climate change for 100 kilometers around Boulder for the next 10 years. What would that possibly look like? What would the models look like? And how do we need to be funding people in order to get those kinds of models together as we go ahead from here? next image then. So we have some sense of what's going on at the administration level. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. We've heard from the National Research Council, the National Science Foundation. So what is Congress saying about these things? So in the 2010 markup language that we got back for our budget, which is not appropriated yet, but we're, uh, we're hopeful that it's going to be appropriated before too long. This is what Congress says, in the 20, this is the House language anyway, for 2010. So the House is on record, as far as the National Science Foundation budget is concerned, of supporting climate change research. So let's go back eight months, 10 months, a year ago, in terms of what we heard about climate change. Here we have Congress weighing very clearly in on the NSF budget and saying climate change is an important issue. There are a couple more quotes from the markup language. We're also asking the Science Foundation to set aside $2 million in each division for high-risk transformative research. I'm going to cycle back to this later on when I talk about managing science. The Congress is very much interested in what the Science Foundation and other agencies are thinking about, I might add very quickly, in terms of this whole area of high-risk transformative research they're sufficiently interested that on October 8th, uh, myself, a representative from industry and a representative from another sector yet to be named, will be testifying before Congress on the question of high-risk transformative research before the House Science and uh, uh, Education Committee. So that will happen on October 8th. So they're very much interested in this whole area and we're developing testimony now on this point.
I'm going to come back to it in a second. Let's hear what else Congress has to say. Again, so here's the language that's coming back to us for 2010. I have to say, I don't, I'm no expert on Congress, but this has to be the first time LTER and NEON have been called out in congressional language coming back to the National Science Foundation. And they're asking us to think through the relationship between the kinds of, uh, kinds of data that are collection, collected in LTER, the kinds of data that will be collected for NEON, this new NEON distributed system. So they're on board with NEON as far as this new system and the need to establish the mechanisms with the budget request for fiscal year 2001. So they're looking ahead as far as where NEON is going to be and we'll be sending this information working with you folks. They have more to say though. This was a remarkable set of markup language that came back to us. They call out metagenomics in particular. So Dave alluded to the sorts of collections that would be going on in microbial in areas of microbial biology. Metagenomics has opened up all kinds of opportunities for working with microbes that, uh, as I look, many of the phenotypes in this room could not even dream about when we were graduate students coming along. What we can do with microbial systems now as a result of metagenomics, not having to culture these systems, is just remarkable. And Congress has weighed in on it and said, look, we're thinking about soil science and we know about metagenomics and we want to keep that in front of you as far as NSF is concerned. Then the last thing they have to say, which is particularly interesting as far as this group is concerned, but also larger policy issues as far as the country is concerned, is they allude to uh, these distributed networks and the future of distributed networks as envisioned for NEON. So there is this vision as far as what NEON is and can be going ahead from here. They talk to oceanography, limnology, terrestrial marine ecology, terrestrial and marine ecology, and then this last sentence is a remarkable sentence. And if this holds in the budget language going forward, it really will be a truly remarkable sentence in that Congress is saying, funding for such systems is appropriate for the MREFC account. So this is a distinctive moment where the ecological community, I have to say, has been a real leader, along with the OOI activity, the Ocean Observing Initiative, as far as the geosciences is concerned. Where Congress is saying, historically, we have looked to MRFC as far as large telescopes are concerned, as far as colliders are concerned, as far as ships are concerned. Now they're saying, along with those kinds of data collection devices, along with, along with that kind of infrastructure, there is another kind of infrastructure for the 21st century. And that is highly distributed sensor networks that can be collecting information. And that's appropriate as far as the MREOC account is concerned to build out those sorts of systems. And NEON and OOI, they were part of the leadership, I believe, that got Congress to this particular point as far as this particular language is concerned. So you're really going to watch and want to read the budget when it finally comes out. I know it's not something we usually pick up in our free time to read, but the budget could be especially interesting this time as it goes forward in terms of 2010 and the language. But this is the early language that we're seeing from Congress. So in terms of pulling together this first section then, we have the President of the United States standing up at the National Academy of Sciences and saying science is a national priority. And he echoed this again just a few days ago in Troy, New York, in terms of the importance of science and having that as a national priority. Now let's just take a moment and put that in a little bit of perspective because it's going to be important as I get to the end of my talk in terms of emphasizing what you folks are and the key role that you're beginning to play, that you have played, but are really going to begin to play even more so as far as this nation is concerned. So when we look at the interface between science and policy in the United States, you can begin to anchor yourself fairly strongly even during the Civil War where scientists approached Lincoln and said, we think we have some contributions to make. And Lincoln agreed with that. And Lincoln agreed with it to the point where he helped create the National Academy of Sciences during the Civil War. But the scientists sort of began to drift in as far as informing the government relative to policy, and in fact really weren't providing the kind of information that the government needed. So it was actually just before World War I, around the time of World War I, that scientists once again came forward, but the National Research Council was created at that time to give direct guidance as far as the government is concerned, direct advice anyway. 
Now we have the NRC in place, but the NRC really wasn't doing their job either. And so we go into the Great Depression, and Roosevelt at that time now looks to scientists again and creates the Science Advisory Board during the Depression in order to give him advice. The Science Advisory Board then was held onto and goes on to World War II, where scientists give significant advice as far as the government is concerned, led especially by Van Evar Bush. Bush was sufficiently confident about the kind of advice that scientists could bring to the central government that he encouraged Roosevelt to create something called the National Science Foundation starting at the end of World War II and then going on post-World War II. The foundation wasn't created immediately because of political differences between central government, the federal government, and what the scientists wanted. And only through a complex set of negotiations did Truman finally sign, sign off on the National Science Bill, the National Science Foundation Bill in about 1950. And the negotiated agreement created the National Science Board within the National Science Foundation as an advisory group to the scientists. But he didn't want to give complete control to the National Science Foundation. That was Truman's trump card. He wanted the science board in there. And that's how that dual way of running the Science Foundation came about. Post that period then, Truman is working with the scientists, but having somewhat of a fraught relationship because they wanted information especially as far as nuclear energy is concerned. But the scientists often had different, I mean generic here, and different kinds of ideas, uh, especially on nuclear energy, where some of them, for example, wanted the nuclear secrets released to the world. And Truman said, this is not the kind of thing that I want, and began to distance himself as far as direct science input is concerned. Eisenhower had pretty much the same sort of opinion until Sputnik goes up. And when Sputnik goes up, Eisenhower turned immediately to the science community created a science advisor within the White House, and created the antecedent of PCAST. So PCAST now we have in place as a result of all these kinds of interactions that happen. And between Eisenhower and you go on to Clinton, you go on to Bush 1, you go on to Bush 2, science and policy makers have this somewhat back and forth fraught relationship, sometimes in, sometimes out. The point is, as far as this president is concerned, and as far as this community of scientists is concerned, this administration is very much interested in science advice. They've said we want the scientists at the table in terms of making policy. And that in the history of this country is not a given. It is not a given how scientists will be informing policy makers. It is a relationship that you can argue either side of that coin with some policy makers signing, saying we don't need the scientists at the table at the final decision because we want that kind of distancing. So what that relationship looks like is not simple, it is complex, and it's variable over the years. And we are at a point now where this administration is working that out, and will be very interested to see how that plays out. So we have information now from the executive branch, as far as what they're thinking, and we have information now from the legislative branch. The Supreme Court has not weighed on this, but I don't expect them to come in anytime soon. Two branches of government are being very clear about where the future is in terms of environment, in terms of energy, in terms of policy, in terms of all the information and kinds of things that are interest to this community here that's interested in building the And the question is, how can this group inform the government as we go ahead?